welcome to Rice Fall. Good morning. Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's so good to be able to worship with you today, and I appreciate you, the fact that you've taken time out of your day to worship with us. A couple of things that I want to uh, talk to you about before we get started with worship. A couple of things going on in the life of the church. As you're well aware by now, we have two new pastors on staff, Reverend Julia Crone and Reverend David Haley. And I want to give you the opportunity to meet with them. In fact, um, if you will go to the eBlast, you will see opportunities to where you can sign up to come to a meet and greet, to meet Julia and David in person, spend a little time with them, get to know them better. One of those is happening this afternoon from four to six. Another is this coming Tuesday from seven to nine. And the third will be a week from Monday, again from four to six. So if you go to that e-blast and check it out, you can sign up for a time that works best for you. Also, have you, have you checked out the book, The Walk? from Adam Hamilton. We talked about this last week and I'm going to start a preaching series today based on the five essential practices for Christians on their faith journey. So I hope that you'll grab a copy of The Walk. You can come by the office and pick up a copy for just $10 and that way you can follow along with this current sermon series. Well that's all I have for today. Let's go ahead and continue with our worship. Praise the Lord with the sound of trumpet. Praise the Lord with the harp and flute. Praise the Lord with the gentle sounding flute. Praise the Lord with the gentle sounding flute. Praise the Lord in the field and forest. Praise the Lord in the city square. Praise the Lord in its time and anywhere. Praise the Lord with the crashing cymbal. Praise the Lord with the pipe and string. You sing. Praise the Lord on a weekday morning. Praise the Lord on a Sunday noon. Praise the Lord by the light of sun or moon. I invite you to bow your head in prayer with me. O oh Lord our God, you are worthy of all our praise. You are the God who never fails to keep his promises. We thank you that in Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, we see your love, justice, mercy, provision, and victory. You are the God who lifts up those who are weighed down. You are the God who provides for your children. Our desire is to praise you as long as we live through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Psalm chapter 34, verses 1 through 10. 
I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise will always be in my mouth. I praise the Lord. Let the suffering listen and rejoice. Magnify the Lord with me. Together let us lift his name up high. I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to God will shine. Their faces are never ashamed. The suffering person cried out. The Lord listened and saved him from every trouble. On every side, the Lord's messenger protects those who honor God, and he delivers them. Taste and see how good the Lord is. The one who takes refuge in him is truly happy. You are who the Lord's holy ones honor him, because those who honor him don't lack a thing. Even strong young lions go without and get hungry, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. you. Let us pray. Triune God, we come to you this morning excited to worship you. When we look around the world, we see the evidence of your glory and your goodness. We also come to you this morning in great need. We need to encounter you and to be transformed by your love. Be with us now and hear these prayers. We pray for Christians all over the world. 
Holy Spirit, fall on us and transform us like you did at Pentecost. Work in us and enable us to will and work for your good pleasure. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for our country and for all the nations of the world. Guide us in the ways of justice and peace and help us to honor and serve each other. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Give us respect and appreciation for the earth as your own creation. Teach us to use its resources rightly, not for our own selfish gain, but in the service of others and to your honor and glory. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We ask for your blessing for our friends, our family, our communities. Help us to serve Christ by serving them and help us love them as Christ has loved us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. Give them courage and hope in the midst of their suffering and bring them the joy that comes only from you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, we thank you and praise you for your great love. We offer these prayers in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We now come to the time in our service where we have the opportunity to worship God by giving back a portion of what God has given to us. We know that everything that we have comes from God. And so our giving is a response to the generosity that God has shown to us. There's several ways that you can give at this time. The first is by writing a check and mailing it to P.O. Box 748, Wrightsville Beach, North Carolina, 28480. You can also give on our website, wrightsvilleumc.org, or by using our smartphone app. As we prepare to worship God through our giving, please join me in prayer. All things come from you, O oh God, and with gratitude we return to you what is yours. You created all that is, and with love you formed us in your image. All that we are and all that we have is a trust from you. And so in gratitude for all your gifts, we offer you ourselves and all that we have in union with Christ's offering for us. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen.
Hi Brightsville kids, I'm Pastor Julia. I'm wondering today if you can think of some of the things that we do when we come to church. Maybe if you are sitting with someone else, why don't you turn to them and tell them some of the things that we do. Let's see, we usually sing a song, we pray, sometimes we give our money, there's a lot of different things that we do when we come to church together. And all of those things that we do are part of worshiping God. Worshiping God really just means thanking God for all the wonderful things that he does for us and telling God we love you so, so much. And like you can see, we do a lot of different things in church because there's a lot of different ways that we can worship God. Today, I want to show you guys one really fun way that you can worship God. And it's something that I learned when I was a kid going to camp. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to say a couple of lines, and then I want you to stand up where you are and repeat after me. Okay? So I'll do them each twice, and you follow along. And make sure you get the grown-ups with you to do it, too. Okay. Ready? Our God is a big God. Our God is a big God. Our God is a strong God. Our God is a strong God. Our God is a mighty God. Our God is a mighty God. There's nothing our God cannot do. There's nothing our God cannot do. The mountains are his. The mountains are his. The rivers are his. The rivers are his. The stars are his handiwork too. The stars are his handiwork too. There's nothing our God cannot do. There's nothing our God cannot do. Yay, God! Yay, God! I hope that you had fun worshiping God today with me. I'll see you later. As was mentioned earlier in the service today, we're beginning a new series based on Adam Hamilton's book, The Walk, which gives us five essential practices for Christians on their Christian journey. And the first practice is actually two. It's worship and prayer. And for that, we're going to learn about what the first Christians did when it came to worship and prayer by going to the book of Acts, chapter 2, this is right after Pentecost, beginning in verse 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayers. All came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, we give you thanks for this day and the opportunity to worship you from wherever we are. Holy God, we know that we are always in your presence. We love you. We thank you for the life that you've given us. We ask that our will be more in line with yours. And Father, we ask that you would hear our needs, and Lord, that we might be instruments of meeting those needs. In Jesus' name, amen. Big Ed went to church 
and listen to the preacher. When people were invited to come forward for prayer at the end of the service, Big Ed got in line. What do you want me to pray about? asked the preacher. About my hearing, answered Big Ed. So the preacher promptly put one finger in Big Ed's ear and, and put his hand on top of his head and he prayed fervently for Big Ed's hearing to improve. And after several minutes, the preacher said, Amen. And he asked Big Ed, How's your hearing now? I don't know, replied Big Ed. The hearing won't be till next week down at the courthouse. Bad job. I bet you tell somebody this week, though. <laughs> I'm just messing with you. You know, when I was 16, the rock band U2 released an album that forever changed the way I look at music. I'd been listening to the pop music of the 80s because the songs had a great beat or they had a clever video. But suddenly there was this album that talked about real world problems with spiritual overtones. Of course, U2 was following a path that many rock bands had walked before them, but I was only 16 and I didn't understand all that at the time. This sounded fresh to me. And of course, if you're my age, you know I'm talking about the album called The Joshua Tree. One of the songs from that album that you'll still hear on the radio today is titled, I Still Haven't Found What I'm Looking For. The lead singer Bono calls it a gospel song with a restless spirit. He talks specifically about Christianity when he sings, I believe in the kingdom come when all the colors will bleed into one. And later he sings about Jesus. He says, you broke the bonds and you loosed the chains, carried the cross of my shame. You know I believe it. But as the title suggests, he still hasn't found what he's looking for. And he won't. Not until he gets to heaven. Bono acknowledged his salvation, but he also struggled with the fact that setbacks still occur in his life from time to time. Our lives are not perfect, even for Christians. But our Creator God wants the best for all of us. And this is why He sent His Son, Jesus Christ, into the world to take away our sins and give us eternal life. And because God created us, redeemed us from our sin, and continued to sustain us daily, the appropriate response is to say, thank you. Yes, it is true that not every day will be perfect. We will have setbacks. But God continues to give us life, family, friends, the talents, the resources, the brain power, and the willpower that allows us to have food, water, shelter, love, medicine, technology, all that surrounds us in this world. We owe it all to our loving God. Most importantly, through His Son Jesus, He saves us from death and instead gives us a forever life with Him in heaven. Acknowledging that, is a sign of worship. And so we gather with other Christians to do it every week. In our new book called The Walk, pastor and author Adam Hamilton teaches us that our most basic understanding of worship starts with the words, thank you for all the gifts in our life. After we realize that all these gifts are given to us because God loves us, then we begin to say, I love you too. And one of the ways we say I love you too is by attending corporate worship with other Christians each and every week. Worship says we're putting God first in our lives. That's why we're here or watching online. That's why we hear His word read and proclaimed. That's why we sing His praise. That's why we give an offering. That's why we pray to Him. Of course, we can do all those things individually as well. But God prescribed corporate worship to his people just as soon as they got across the Red Sea and escaped from slavery. So we do it because God told us to. But we also recognize so many benefits that come from worshiping together as we walk this Christian journey. Of course, most of our week, we live, we live fairly independently from one another. I see my closest neighbors maybe a few minutes every other day. And if I'm lucky, I might get to have a decent conversation with them once a week. The same is true with church. We're not physically together in worship every moment of our lives. 
We need a practice that will sustain us when we're apart. And fortunately, once again, God provides. This is why we pray. I'm praying for you, people tell me. Thousands of people have said that to me over the years, and I am most grateful. I owe my livelihood to all of these people, but how does prayer work? What are the right words to say? Jesus tried to tell us. He gave us an example in the Lord's Prayer. And I think there's a lot we can learn from that example. First of all, prayer is adoration. Jesus says, when you pray, say, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. When it comes to prayer, God is more Abba, more Daddy, than he is Almighty. He is our Father, not just my Father. And his name is not Howard, as so many people believe. Rather, his name is hallowed, meaning holy, sacred, revered. To pray is to adore. Father, we adore you and we lay our lives before you. Adoration is the yearning of the heart to worship, to honor, to magnify, and to bless God. Ask for nothing but to cherish him. Seek nothing but his exaltation. Focus on nothing but his goodness. Sometimes prayer needs words, but Jesus showed us that it really doesn't take very many. Some adoration is private. I would guess I pray out loud in the company of others more than most people, and yet 99% of my prayers are just between me and God. Jesus told us in the Sermon on the Mount to go into our room and close the door in order to pray to our God, and I believe most prayers are private. But some adoration is public, and that's what happens when we worship. Sometimes I wonder if we who worship all the time understand the meaning of worship. We've been brainwashed into believing that the leaders are the performers and the congregation is the audience, so much so that we can't get away from it even when we come to church. But church is different. Worship is a drama where God is the audience. The leaders are the prompters, the congregation, the performers. If we ever embrace this concept, it would change our whole attitude about worship. We are not here to please each other. We're here to please God. Secondly, prayer is an alignment of wills. We say, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. If your wheels are out of alignment on your car, you got a problem. A car will not steer properly and you'll wear out your tires before their time. Tires work better when they work together. Well, the same is true for the will. When our wills are in union with God's will, life flows more smoothly. There is a will of God, and the will of God is not as hidden as we sometimes make it out to be. It is the will of God that all people will be saved. It is the will of God that his kingdom will rule on earth as it is in heaven. It's the will of God that not one of his little ones should perish. It's the will of God for good to overcome evil. It's the will of God for justice to roll down like rivers and righteousness like a mighty stream. It's the will of God that you and I learn to love our neighbors as ourselves. It's the will of God that you and I hear the cry of the needy. It's the will of God that people be delivered from racism, sexism, nationalism, and consumerism. Come to think of it, I know a lot more about the will of God than I'm usually willing to follow. Everything that happens on earth is not the will of God as it happens in heaven. That's why we need to pray. It's why we need to work against crime, abuse, greed, and all attitudes that destroy communities. It's why we need to work for the healing of diseases, the care of the earth, the empowerment of the poor, the fair distribution of the world's goods and resources. That's why we need to be good stewards of all that God has entrusted us with. The kingdom of God on earth demands our deepest loyalty and our unfailing commitment. When our wills collide with the will of God, we do well to surrender. Now, nobody said surrender is easy. We beg, we pout, we demand. 
We expect God to perform like a magician or to shower us with blessings like Santa Claus. We want instant solutions and resort to manipulative prayers. But the end of prayer is not to win a concession from the one who is all-powerful, but rather to have communion with the one who is all-loving. Which brings us to number three. Prayer is asking. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Because we have physical needs, we are invited to ask. Jesus put it boldly when he said, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened unto you. Boldly we approach the throne of God to make our needs known. And God welcomes those requests. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. Our requests present the problem of an unanswered prayer, though. Moses prays to enter the promised land, and he dies on Mount Nebo. Paul prays three times for that thorn in his flesh to be removed, but God replies, My grace is sufficient, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Why are some prayers not answered the way we wish? Well, Sometimes our will is not in line with God's will. We become manipulative in our asking, expecting God to twist another's will when we can't do it ourselves. We don't know what we really need. If God had granted all the silly prayers I've made in my life, where would I be now? As the great theologian Garth Brooks once sang, sometimes I thank God for unanswered prayers. Of course, I sometimes take issue with Mr. Brooks' song. And say, you know, sometimes the answer to your prayer is simply no. Because God knows better than we do. We don't have the patience to wait it out, though. Some things take time. Some things take a lot of time. It takes more than one lifetime for God's will to be done. When my grandmother died of cancer, it wasn't because my prayers were unanswered. Rather, it was because she was finally experiencing the full cure from the debilitating pain that she had been feeling here on earth. Henry, excuse me, Harry Emerson Fosdick once said, No good prayer ever comes weeping home. For either God changes the circumstances, or he supplies sufficient power to overcome them. Prayer changes things. Or prayer changes us. Either way is all right, even when things seem to be all wrong. Because we have spiritual needs, we need to make our requests known. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Bob and Judy Fisher, in their book, Life is a Gift, discovered there's an urgency among hospice patients to forgive and be forgiven. The emotional burden of carrying a backpack full of unforgiven issues can get really heavy. It's a burden the soon departed are not usually willing to carry. For instance, I once had a church member who was dying of cancer. She had every reason to be bitter, but she chose to be forgiving. You see, her husband was an alcoholic, often abusive. He would had an affair with a member of their own family. When he had a stroke, she cared for him for 13 years until his death. Now, she could have taken revenge on an abusive, unfaithful husband. Instead, she forgave him and the sister-in-law with whom he'd had the affair. She told me, I no longer have the strength to hold grudges. I don't want to waste the rest of my life on bitterness. Now, I never met the husband in question, but when I learned the wife's story, I felt sorrow for her and judgment toward her ex-husband, but not her. She was okay. I mean, seriously. Now, she was certainly glad she was no longer married to him, but she never wanted him to die. And she didn't want to spend the last weeks of her life full of resentment and pain. So she forgave him. And that brought her peace. And what's true of forgiveness, likewise... Is true of temptation. Ask the Savior to help you. Comfort, strengthen, and keep you. He is willing to aid you, and He will carry you through. Prayer and worship. 
worship, and prayer. They go hand in hand. Simple words, really. Thank you. I love you. I need you. May my will be yours. If you're following along with the book, The Walk, Pastor Adam Hamilton invites us to make these spiritual practices of worship and prayer into holy habits. He gives us a challenge that I'd like to extend to you today. Can we worship 90% of the Sundays throughout the year? Adam says, if you remember back in school, if you made at least a 90 on a test, you made an A. Well, there are 23 Sundays left in the year after this one. You'd have to worship 21 times between now and then to reach 90%. You can worship in the sanctuary. You can worship online. Either one is fine. Who's up for the challenge? Can you worship at least 90% of the Sundays between now and the end of the year? We're going to add a QR code to our online services beginning next week so you can check in even if you're out of town, even if you're watching at home, so long as you watch the service, you can check in. Let us know of your presence. Secondly, Adam suggests we pray at least five times a day. Great idea. And he makes it easy. Once when you get up, once at breakfast, once at lunch, once at dinner, and once when you go to bed. Five times. You can pray more than that, of course. But what if all of us were praying at least five times a day? Let's, let's try to take that on through the end of the year as well. Okay? I know it'll make a difference in your life. I know it'll make a difference in our church. How can you tell God that you love him? In what ways do you need him? How can your will become more aligned with his? What do you have to thank him for today? Prayer and worship. Worship and prayer. These are our first steps in the Christian journey. Let's take this walk together. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, you are an awesome God, creator of all that we are, all that we see, all that we experience in this world. Holy God, thank you for the blessings in our lives. Thank you for our family and friends and place in your church. Lord, help us to be mindful of the needy. And sometimes the needy is us. Help us to be brave enough to ask. And may our wills become more aligned with yours. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're beginning our walk together, and I've given you two challenges for week one. Can we worship 90% of the Sundays between now and the end of the year? Now, church will be open, of course, all of those Sundays. We will worship online all of those Sundays, but can you make it 90% of the time? 21 of the next 23 Sundays. You can be in person, you can be online. That's challenge number one. Challenge number two. Can we pray five times a day? Beginning when we wake up, then breakfast, lunch, dinner, and when we go to bed. Five times a day. Prayer and worship. Worship and prayer. This is, these are the building blocks 
for the Christian walk. Let's walk together. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.